Well, we're going to kick off a new sermon series uh, for a couple of weeks here. We're going to look at the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Now, a while back, I talked about Elisha, who was his understudy, but I didn't talk about Elijah a whole bunch. So we're going to talk about Elijah for a little bit and dig in there. If you don't know where to find him, that's in uh, uh, 1 Kings, as it says on the screen there. Today is going to be 1 Kings 17, 1 through 16. Next week will be 1 Kings 18, and the following week... 1 Kings 19, you know, very creative thinking there, Pastor, right? Um, That's where we'll be heading, so if you want to follow along, there are Bibles in some of the seats. You're welcome to use your phones if uh, you've got, Uversion is a great app uh, to look things up. Uh, But to start things out, have you ever, uh, ever, ever run your car out of gas? Anybody ever done that before? I have, only twice. Um, just two times, and both times, clearly my fault, and both times, I knew it was going to happen, I knew I was pressing my luck, and I knew the risk was relatively minor, Um, I was almost to my destination, and and I decided to see if I could make it or not, and then was willing to suffer the consequences if I didn't, and in two cases, I didn't, right? Uh, The last time it happened to me was way back when I was in seminary, and I was living in the Twin Cities. Uh, I worked in Roseville. I lived up in Arden Hills at Bethel Seminary there, and and I had just gotten off of work. It was late at night because most nights when I was working, I closed. I worked in a restaurant. I was a server, trainer, and uh, so I was often there pretty late. But this night, I wasn't there too terribly late. It was probably 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And and so I'd just gotten off work, and I knew I was on vapors, but I knew if I headed north on 35W... There was a gas station on the exit of County Road E2 in Roseville there, right before you would get to that intersection of 694 and 35W. So, so I knew if I could just get there, I, I could get gas. It wouldn't be a problem. So I took the chance. I hopped on 35W, uh, flying down the interstate in the Twin Cities, because that's the shortest route from point A to point B. And like I said, I know that I'm on vapors. And so the closer I get to the station, you know, of course, the, the more your anxiety starts to build. Because, I mean, we're, we're talking, we're like two needle widths below the empty line, right? I'd never pushed my truck this far. Not a good thing. Don't, I don't recommend you do this. It's bad for your fuel pumps. But, but it is what it is. I was doing it. And then wouldn't you know, I could see the exit ramp as my truck began to sputter. And I kept my truck in the right lane just in case this were to happen, right? So I can see that exit ramp. So, so I don't want to lose any momentum, but I know I might get you know, murdered from somebody behind me if I don't get out of the way because I'm starting to slow down. So I, 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 I slowly uh, pull over onto the shoulder and I coast as far as I can, right? Because I really don't want to walk. And I make it just about probably 100 yards from the beginning of that exit ramp all the way over to the side. I mean, over, two wheels all the way over onto the grass because, man, people go whizzing by on 35W. You don't want to be opening your door. It's, it's dangerous, right? And the dilemma was, not only was I out of gas, but it was still 99 degrees out. It was miserable. It was the middle of the summer, and I'm in my work clothes, and I'm like, all right. It's about a total of a half-mile walk to get to that gas station. So I walk all the way, and it's that walk of shame, right? You're, you, you're kind of embarrassed because your vehicle's sitting there. It's blinking lights because it's dark out. It's evening, and and it's over there just blinking, and I'm kind of frustrated and kicking rocks, even though it's my fault, right? And, and so I walk that, that, that last little mile to get the gas. Go back, fill it up, make it home safe. Well, you know, that's kind of the end of the story. But the reason I bring that up is my message today is, is kind of about that same idea of, of, of running out of gas. It's, my, my sermon today is for those of you who have experienced your, your tank running dry, but I'm not talking about your gas tank. I'm talking about, have you ever, have you ever had your spiritual tank kind of run dry? You ever, you ever been maybe going full speed ahead in life? And you've been working hard, and you've been praying hard, you've been trying and loving and serving and all those kinds of things, but, but that tank just gets lower and lower and lower. And pretty soon you, spiritually, are running on vapors, right? If you've ever experienced lasting defeat, if you've ever had all that you've come to depend on taking away from you for a season, if you've ever had to endure a seemingly endless famine in your spiritual life, then this message today is for you. My goal is to to bring you some hope. And I'm especially preaching to you if you're going through a a period of your faith life, a period of your life, a a spiritual drought, when it seems like maybe the Lord has been 
kind of distant, maybe far away from you, and his, his presence perhaps seems that it's a little bit absent for you. I mean, you've worshipped on the mountaintop before, but now you've been in that, that desert for days or weeks or months. And if it's easier to, to squeeze water out of a rock than it is to find words to pray, I'm here to, to deliver a message of hopeful refreshment to you this morning. Let's talk about spiritual deserts. Spiritual deserts are, are, are absolutely the most mysterious and, and difficult time in Christian life. But they are essential for growth. In faith. In 1 Kings 17, all of the nation of Israel was in a spiritual drought. If you don't know your Old Testament history, uh, there were 19 evil kings that had been reigning over God's people. If you read your Old Testament, it frequently says, talking about these kings. And they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? These guys were knuckleheads. They didn't lead God's people well. And there had been 19 of these terrible, horrible, no good, bad kings reigning over the nation of Israel, 19 in a row, and now the worst of them all comes along, a guy by the name of King Ahab. You probably have heard of him, right? King Ahab has taken a, a stranglehold on God's people, on Israel. And he's an idol-serving, pagan-worshipping disgrace. Even, even the priests, the, the people who were to, to be the leaders of the, of the church of that time, the, the temple, the, the priests even had become corrupted. Or if they hadn't become corrupted, they'd just flat out run away for their lives because it was unsafe for them. And so, to counteract this spiritual drought, God's prophet Elijah calls for a physical drought. And that comes in verse 1 of 1 Kings 17. Now, as he calls for this actual physical drought, we see in this story that even the prophet himself will have to be subject to it. So he's going to go through the drought along with all of the other people. And if you're following along, if you read verse 1 there, you'll see that not even the dew formed during the morning. It was that dry. Right Now, droughts and famines, they happen in every area of life. In baseball, if you're a baseball fan, it's called a slump, right? Even Hall of Famers have them, don't they? One time, many of you know who Mickey Mantle is, right? Mickey Mantle was one of the all-time greatest baseball players, just, just an amazing, gifted baseball player. And, and one time, old Mickey was in the middle of just a slump that was going... Game after game after game. And one particular evening way back in the 1950s here, he struck out in three at-bats in a row, which, which is not something he did very frequently. And, and, and just disgraced, he, he sat down in the dugout and he threw his helmet in the dirt. And he just kind of bent over and, and put his head in his hands and was just kind of mumbling and, and grousing to himself. And as he was sitting there in the dugout with his head in his hands, this, this young little bat boy comes walking over to him. And it so happened that this young bat boy was Tommy Berra, the, the son of Yogi Berra, the famous manager of the Yankees, right? And Tommy walks over him, taps Mickey Mantle on the knee. Mick looks up, and little, little Tommy's there looking him in the eyes, and tenderly looks at him, and he says, Hey, you stink. <laughs> You know Yogi Berra, that kind of fits, right? <laughs> droughts happen in life, though, right? In every area of life. But spiritual droughts are the worst. When the brook runs dry in your soul, the easiest thing to do is, is just to, to wrap yourself in the cocoon of despair and, and quit, frankly, right? But despairing and quitting, they're hardly ever godly options. And I want to look closely at this passage this morning because I do believe it can reveal the keys to survival when it feels like your life source has evaporated. First of all, we notice in this passage that God still has a plan for the prophet Elijah. Look at verse 2. It says, Then the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, he says. Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Now, any of you know what a wadi is? W-A-D-I? 
This is a picture of a Middle Eastern wadi. A wadi is a small body of water that, that doesn't appear except for during the rainy seasons. And if you were to study the, the original Hebrew, that's actually what it's referring to where, where Elijah gets sent to. Is more than a, it's, it's not a brook or a running river. It's, it's a wadi like this, right? And so he gets sent to this wadi. And so, so it means that, that God has sustained Elijah by a pool that should not have normally ever existed at that time because we're in the middle of a drought, right? And could it be that the dry spell, maybe if you're experiencing one right now, maybe in that dry spell, God has a solution in mind that you don't even know is possible. See, Elijah had no idea this place God was sending to him in the desert even existed. You might say, you know, I, ha- I haven't felt God's presence much lately. But maybe, maybe God is even now giving you some strength through that experience. Strength through a, a deep running spring, an a, a pr- unexpected pool of water that you didn't even know existed. Now, Elijah called for the drought, but the drought wasn't Elijah's fault. But Elijah is called to be obedient in the midst of that drought anyhow. You too may be called to obedience during a time of spiritual drought. A drought that you might not have any control over, no power whatsoever to control. But I want you to understand this. You see, God never calls us to endure a situation that He Himself is not prepared to sustain us through. But that's not all. When He's out there at this oasis, so to speak, in the desert, in this dry season, the Bible tells us of another neat surprise that occurs. But notice also that God says, You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. And guess what? It actually happened, right? Verse 6 in the Bible says, The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. Right there in your Bible. Can you, can you imagine that, right? Ravens? The dark, the dirty, scavenging birds, ravens? The birds, if you've read your Old Testament, that the law declares as unclean, are going to bring the prophet of God his food? See, usually ravens are, are, are greedy robbers. They snatch up the little dirty tidbits from carcasses, right? But God uses the most unlikely source to supply his prophet. I mean, can, can you imagine... First of all, I mean, he, he finds this oasis in the desert that God leads him to. I mean, that's a, an amazing blessing in this spiritual drought. And so he's sitting there by this pool of water that shouldn't exist. And then all of a sudden, rah, rah, and these birds start flying over, right? And they're like dropping T-bones on him. Maybe hot dogs. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But can you imagine the, the astonishment on Elijah's face? Like, like they, the Bible says, it's dropping bird. It's, the bird's dropping bread and, and, and meat. But just when things are starting to look up again for our old prophet Elijah, one morning he wakes up sitting next to this pool of water, or he had been sitting next to a pool of water, bends over to wash his face and you know, get kind of the crusties out of your eye. Just sand. Where'd my water go, right? He wakes up and the water is gone. We see that in verse 7. The miraculous water that should have never been there in the very first place, and our story has dried up. And it's gone. It's dry as the rest of the countryside. Let me tell you, at this point in the spiritual cycle, it's this point where we begin to get really get frustrated, right? Like, like, we've been in a spiritual dry desert, but we've had a little something that's been sustaining us. And then all of a sudden, that, that little something's gone. Oh, we can lose hope there, can't we? We feel like God has removed His manifest presence from our life. It can be an incredibly frustrating moment. This is often our spiritual darkest hour. And it's the most likely point for an emotional crash for us. 
God has provided some morsels in the past, but now, nothing. This is where a lot of Christians say, that's it. I've taken this God thing as far as it can. I've given it its best shot. I, I, it's worked for a while maybe, and I've been depending on God, but, but now I'm going to rely on the one person that I know never lets me down, of course. That's me, right? Well, if you know anything about us, that's not true. We let ourselves down constantly. But when the brook dries up, that real crisis point has arrived, right? And when we reach that point, there's only two alternatives. We either persevere in a life of discipleship, continuing to follow after what God wants for us, or we turn to the natural alternative, and that's the human path of, of self, self-preservation, of, of trying to do it on my own. I remember when I was learning to ride a bike. I talked about a little girl a few weeks back. And I remember when I was learning to ride a bike, right? I was so grateful as a child for some brilliant person who invented those extra little wobbly side wheels, right? The training wheels. Training wheels kept me up for, for months when I was learning to ride a bicycle. Back when I was a little squirt. It's hard to believe at one time I was little. But those training wheels, they were, they were a godsend. They were a blessing. They kept me going, right? I couldn't have made it without those training wheels. And for Elijah, that was this brook. He's got this this brook that's been holding up one side of the bike, and he's got the ravens that have been holding up the other side of the bike, right? He's got water, he's got bread and meat, everything's being taken care of. While he called for the drought, he's not really been suffering too bad, right? And so he kind of kind of learns how to ride a bike for a little while. But then God says, all right, Elijah, if you're really ready to ride, let's get those training wheels off, right? And so the ravens disappear. The, the, the brook, as we see in verse 7, dries up. And then there's this, there's this moment when you're learning to ride a bike, right? Many of you can remember this. When your training wheels are off, your father's been running alongside of you, holding you up with his hands. But in order to actually be a bicycle rider, the father has to release you at some point, doesn't he? There has to be a point of release where the father takes his hands off. First one hand and then the other. And then for that split second, of course, you realize you're doing it, right? You're riding. And the learning curve has to be that way. There is no other way for us to learn. There has to be a point where God takes his hands off of us because only then can can we demonstrate that the training that he has given us has actually really, truly sunk in. It's only then that we can prove that we are authentically on the path of Christ-likeness. Because listen, it's not faith if God is standing in front of your eyes your whole life. There's no faith involved in that. But I promise you this. When God appears to take his hands off of you, when God God begins to let you live by faith, he will absolutely, he will unquestionably take you back into his arms soon. Remember, Seasons of drought are always temporary. They are seasons. Now, we live in Minnesota. We know how long some seasons get, right? We have this thing called winter. Seems like it lasts forever. But winter always ends. Seasons always end. If God had kept his hands off of Elijah for too long, Elijah surely would have died. He's out in an arid desert area where there's no other sources of food nor water. But if you're following along, look what happens next. God speaks again to Elijah in verse 8. Now, God says, he says, Elijah, my eyes are still on you. Now, go to Zarephath. She's a hundred miles away. And go and live there. For I have directed a widow there to feed you. You see, God has another divine plan 
for enduring the famine years. God always has a plan in place. And in God's discipleship school, there's always another place for us to go and another place for us to grow. If, if that brook, if that wadi at Cherith was, was, so to speak, the bachelor's degree of his faith, when he goes to Zarephath, this becomes the master's of his faith, where he is going to grow in humility. You see, Elijah has to go to this town. He has to go find a widow. And he must submit. He must rely upon this poor, starving woman. And let me remind you, back in this ancient of cultures, the widows were often the the very lowest in the social order. They were the neglected. They were often the downtrodden. And the story tells us, if you read some into it there in 1 Kings 17, that she has her own problems. In verse 10 it tells us, she's down at the city gate, gathering some wood. Even though she's old, she's out doing a bunch of physical labor by herself. Now we know that she has a son, as we read the story, who you think could help her, but we find out later that he's physically ill and near death. And so this this proud, this this strong prophet, this man of God, who's faced off with kings and and, and, and won that toe-to-toe battle before, he now has to go and plead for food from this woman, like a common beggar. And the very last thing that she needs is another mouth to feed. In verse 12, it tells us, she has only left in her life a handful of flour and a little jug of oil. That's all she has left. And her plans are, are, are to take just this little bit of flour and this little bit of oil that she has left. And she's taken those sticks that she's just gathered. Her plan is to take all that and make a fire to cook one last meal and die. She's sure that she's come to her end. There's nothing left. And yet, in the middle of this, God jumps in and He says, I'm going to bring these three despairing people together to demonstrate my divine compassion. And so by the the widow's blind obedience, combined with this prophet's faith, God brings them together and He uses one handful of flour and one little jug of oil to miraculously support the three of them for months. Verse 16 tells us that the jar of flour was not used up and neither did the jug of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord that he had previously spoken to the prophet Elijah. You see, God showed up. Think back to your situation now. What is the famine in your land? What have you gone through? Why... Has your tank been on empty? Maybe it's a financial drought. God has allowed the the water that you used to drink from every day to evaporate. But don't you know that the, the, the one who provided that source can instantly provide another? Now it may not come until he's trimmed you down, removed your training wheels, and refocused your life. You might even have to wait on the ravens, but he knows. Maybe your famine is in a relationship. You didn't believe that it could ever run dry, but now it has. And you're losing hope. Maybe it's time for you to go to Zarephath and learn Elijah's lesson of humility. Maybe you're the one that that, that needs to break down and be the beggar and use that handful of faith. That handful that can't be exhausted. My heart goes out to to those who are wandering in the spiritual desert. If you're not in one now, you probably have had one or may have one in the future. And when when we have striven to love the Lord Jesus with all of our hearts, Nothing hurts more than when He steps back from us for a while. But please know this. You're not alone in your struggles. It's the necessary 
cycle of growth. One of the stories I read this week was uh, about a man by the name of David Brainerd, great missionary to the Native Americans in the 1700s. And he was prone to intense battles spiritually against spiritual dehydration in his life. In his journal on January 14, 1743, he, he wrote just these amazingly compelling words of his struggles. And he writes, My spiritual conflicts today were unspeakably dreadful, heavier than the mountains and overflowing floods. It seemed enclosed in hell itself. I was deprived of all sense of God, but even the existence of a God. But in this, it taught me the absolute dependence of a creature upon a God, the Creator, for everything that can ever bring me happiness. There's a great list of people in the Bible who've experienced spiritual droughts. Think of King David, right? David the king, the psalmist, he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. But his words were, But God, thou art with me, right? Jesus himself spent 40 days in the desert being tempted. He suffered spiritual agony and loneliness at the Garden of Gethsemane. And then again, of course, on the cross. But yet, he saved the world. The disciples. The disciples spent three of the longest days in all of history, an emotional and spiritual defeat after Jesus' death. They had no idea that a resurrection was coming. You see, that's the amazing part about wilderness times. We have no idea how or when God is going to display His brilliance in crafting our rescue. It's kind of like digging a tunnel through a mountain. You're just digging and you never know when you're going to emerge out of that other side until, ping, your pick hits and that beam of light comes through. And you see, God's plans of rescue are better, better than any, any movie could devise, better than any book author could invent. Imagine a rainy season brook in the middle of a drought in the middle of the desert. Imagine... Ravens flying over and dropping you some hot dogs. The exciting part is, you need the faith to use today's blessings to make sure that tomorrow's will come. See, you need the faith to use the blessings that you have today to bring you through till tomorrow. Even when it feels like you're in a spiritual drought. Because tomorrow will come. It always does. You see, He's the God of unending abundance. He's the God of surprise endings. Trust Him. Rely upon Him. Use up whatever faith that you have and see if that jar, small as it may be, isn't full again tomorrow. It doesn't matter how small your jar is. It doesn't matter how desperate your situation may be. It doesn't matter how deep or dark the cavern you are in. It doesn't matter how dry your land or how dark the night or how cold your relationship or how lonely your soul or how empty your tank. It's the cycle of faith. And after the drought, droughts are ended by rain. It's the cycle of hope. After the drought, God always brings the rain. Let's pray. God, we pray on this day, in this moment, for those who are struggling, for those who have felt like they are in this desert, Lord. Maybe they've been discouraged. They've been hurting perhaps even felt lost and abandoned, felt distant from you. 
God, I pray on this day that they would hear this word that you have not abandoned nor forsaken them. You have promised that. You've given us your word that you never will. But God, in those seasons of drought, spiritual dryness, where it feels like we're wandering in a desert alone, I just pray for your mercy and encouragement along the way. I pray, God, that we would be steadfast, that we would work and continue on in faith and grow. Lord, sometimes growth is painful. But God, think of the amazing ways you can use our stories on the other side of it. Lord, we are thankful that you love us and that you are truly the God of abundance. And so often you have blessed us far beyond anything we could ever imagine and certainly well beyond anything we could ever deserve. And God, just remind us in these times that we don't walk alone, that you are there with us, that you are for us, that you are not against us, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who would love to come alongside of us as well, supporting us, helping us to endure. And Lord, then as we grow, may we share the abundance that you pour into our lives. May we share how you have blessed us even in times of drought that others might hear as well. God, again, we thank you for your blessing, the richness of your love. Oh God, you are truly great and glorious, and we bring you all honor, glory, and praise. Lord, as we go forth in this day, may we go forth perhaps renewed with a sense of hope that you will continue to light our way. And Lord, may we take that, may we love others well, may we show them your great love. Wherever you might send us this week, Father God, make us ambassadors of your light and your love. We love you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' high, holy, and beautiful name. Amen. If you need some prayer today, we'll have a, a prayer team up, up here near the front of the stage, and they would love to pray with you. And uh, anything you would like prayer for, come on up. Otherwise, go forth and be blessed. Go forth and serve your King. Go forth and make a difference in the name of Jesus. Thank you for coming out. God bless. Thank you.